Russia is sending negotiators to Turkey this weekend to try to resolve the crisis in northwest Syria, where Syrian, Russian and Turkish forces are all dangerously close to conflict as President Assad presses on towards the city of Idlib. Since December, his Russian-backed forces have stepped up their deadly assault on Idlib, slowly gaining ground across the south of the province. The offensive has now pushed over half a million people out of their homes in the last two months, many fleeing north to overcrowded refugee camps on the Turkish border. Government forces are now less than 10 miles from Idlib city itself, the last major bastion of the rebels, which is struggling under this sustained new offensive. Turkey is sending more tanks to its observation posts in Syria. Some of them are now behind the Syrian army front line as it advances towards Idlib. With Turkish, Syrian and Russian forces also close to each other, much is riding on talks expected this weekend. <laughs> Civilians in the shrinking rebel-held areas are fleeing at the prospect of Syria retaking control. With the Turkish border closed and the camps along it teeming, they're trying to escape any way they can. A heartbroken call between separated sisters. Law student Razan paid smugglers to get across the border and joined her mother in Turkey three weeks ago. Her sister Batul is stuck because the smugglers won't take her three young children. They've tried to escape for 10 nights in a row, her husband making increasingly desperate offers to get his children away from the killing. And yet some are going back into Syria despite the danger. And the land we can see and that tree is, it's in Syria. I chose this building because I can see the Syrian land. I can feel that I am in, still inside Syria. Dr. Mohammed Al-Abrash brought his family to live in Turkey, but is allowed to cross the border every week to Idlib, where he is a surgeon. All the people living inside Idlib area, they are named as a terrorist, so that we cannot trust the government. And were you against the government before? No, it was really the same. We are living as a normal people in any country, they have con uh, government. So you're not an activist? No, 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 no. I am only a doctor working in hospital. But now today. you're afraid of them? Yeah, of course, of course. I cannot trust them. For me, I, I, I like to stay in my house. Now I lost my house, lost my clinic, lost all my uh, things inside uh, Sarakib, my city. I, I hope I can stay there. Even I have millions here in Turkey, my, my heart there in Syria, in my village, where I was born before. The rebels, who remain a mix of anti-Assad, pro-democracy and Islamist extremist forces, are not giving up. But the overwhelming force of Syria's Russian backers means that if this does continue to a military conclusion, Idlib is falling. Well, earlier I spoke to Ambassador James Jeffrey, the United States Special Representative for Syria, and I began by asking whether the US intends to do anything to halt the crisis around Idlib. 
Well, we are already doing a number of things. Uh, we're looking at sanctions against uh, both Russians and Syrians. We're uh, taking diplomatic action along with France and Britain. Yesterday we had an emergency meeting of the Security Council to expose uh, the extremely dangerous uh, situation that we have with uh, our NATO ally Turkey coming under fire and returning fire. Meanwhile, as the Russians just announced, uh, Syrian air defenses almost shot down an Iranian uh, uh, commercial aircraft. Uh, 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 Airbus. Uh, this is the kind of dangers we have in and around Idlib from the overall fighting that is being generated by this terrible Syrian conflict. But they are taking no attention of anything anybody else is saying, are they? Well, we are doing everything we can uh, through economic and diplomatic pressure uh, to ensure that Russia and Syria in the end realize there is no military solution to this conflict. But what do you suggest the final status of Idlib should be? Do you want Syria to just accept this as a, a rebel stronghold forever? No, absolutely not. There is a process that was agreed to, among others, by Russia and the Security Council in December of 2015. It's called UN Security Council Resolution 2254. As a first step, you have a ceasefire in Idlib and elsewhere, then a national ceasefire, then uh, the UN, which has already started work, but it's being uh, hobbled by, again, the Assad regime, uh, puts together uh, reforms to the Constitution. Well, as you know, there are thousands of fighters who have no intention of giving up. Some of them are pro-democracy fighters, some of them are religious extremists. How, how do you sort them from a massive civilian population without huge civilian deaths. That's exactly what the Russians are doing. They're just uh, uh, dropping barrel bombs and having the Syrian government drop barrel bombs on everybody, mainly the civilians. When you look back, do you think President Trump's airstrike after the alleged use of chemical weapons achieved anything? Well, other than one relatively limited uh, and non-lethal chemical weapons strike that we saw back in the uh, uh, spring of uh, last year. We have not seen the use of chemical weapons by the regime since those two strikes. You talked about the measures you want to take against Syria in terms of sanctions, but are you prepared to ratchet pressure up on Moscow at all? Can you do that at all? Uh, we are looking at uh, various things that we can do. I will be traveling to uh, Ankara, Turkey. Uh, early next week to talk with the Turkish government about uh, uh, the situation in Idlib and how we can be more helpful in achieving a ceasefire. Well, earlier I spoke to the former Foreign Secretary David Miliband, who is now Chief Executive of the Charity International Rescue Committee, which is helping refugees in Syria, and I asked him what he thinks needs to happen now. The two most obvious things that have to be done immediately are, first of all, to have a proper ceasefire, Secondly, to get the humanitarian aid flowing properly to those who are in desperate medical need, but also to those um, who are needed, whose needs are less acute. And then there's a final point that I do want to make. You are showing in your footage the reality of an age of impunity when international humanitarian law is rendered meaningless by the actions of states who are supposed to have signed up to UN conventions. And I think it's essential that in parallel to the calls for a ceasefire, to the improvement of the humanitarian situation. There is a drive for accountability. But isn't Russia here really doing whatever it wants? And there is no big state, the United States being the obvious one to think about, that is taking it on and showing any kind of leadership. Yes, it's, you're right to say that it's not just a question of gridlock in the UN Security Council. It's that the major players on the ground in northwest uh, Syria, namely Turkey, Russia, uh, Syria and Iran, not to be forgotten, are fighting it out amongst themselves. There's a contrast with the situation in northeast Syria, where there are American troops, where there is an American presence, where there's a greater sense of American vested interest. The people on the ground in northwest Syria who we are serving feel they've been completely abandoned by the so-called international community. And the fact that we can't even get the basic norms of war to be, a st to be followed shows you how far we have fallen. And until there is a determination on part of powers like the US, but also, frankly, UK, France, uh, others, uh, to ensure that this has a priority in the wider uh, diplomatic engagement, political engagement that's going on with Russia, 
then the abandonment of the people of Syria will continue. I mean, as a former foreign secretary, when you look at the current international institutions, haven't we now seen the total breakdown of the post-war international settlement? The UN is pointless. I'd put it rather differently, Krishna. I'd see, say we're seeing the abuse of the second, post-Second World War international settlement. We're seeing the abuse of international law that was established under the appropriate slogan, never again. Uh, we're seeing the sidelining of multilateral international institutions, because remember, it should be the United Nations that's convening political talks about the future of Syria. And in fact, it's been sidelined by the Russia, Iran, uh, Turkey, Syria group, the so-called Astana uh, group. We're also seeing the abuse of power on the ground and the changing face of conflict, where civilians make 70% of casualties, where urban warfare is the danger. Uh, what is right, though, is that there is a crisis of international politics, because with the West in retreat, it's giving license to all sorts of other players to fill the vacuum, both states and non-state actors. Because remember, at the heart of this Northwest Syria trauma is the fact that you've got large numbers, maybe 30, 40, even 50,000 fighters of terrorist groups huddled in uh, amongst three and a half million civilians. And it's the three and a half million civilians whose fate is now on the line.